Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Giovanni Vicente Romero, CNM colonist. I'm very delighted to be here. Thank you very much for joining us today at NYUDC, probably my center for this discussion on Puerto Rico's earthquake response, food, family, and FEMA, with World Central Kitchen's CEO, Nate Mook, and the mayor of Ponce, the city in the south of Puerto Rico, where the epicenter was of the epicenter of the earthquake last uh, January hit the island. So thank you very much for joining us today. And we are also joined here today by Gregorio Igartua, attorney and public certified accountant based in Puerto Rico. So Ponce, Puerto Rico is the island's second largest city. The Ponce region was the hardest hit by the earthquakes, the strongest a magnitude of 6.4, leaving, leaving large scale physical damage and psychological trauma accompanied by severe aftershocks. Today, we will focus on relief efforts involving FEMA, as well food and the extended community. We also have speakers we, who will share stories of hope and hospitality. The event will also cover how a celebrity chef became an unofficial humanitarian envoy for disaster management. You know his name, right? Chef Jose Andres. Puerto Ricans have shown tremendous courage in overcoming these earthquakes. People have united as an extended family to lend a helping hand with food and supplies during times of need. Thanks to organizations like Jose Andres World Central Kitchen, people have had a nutritious meal and new grant opportunities to become food entrepreneurs. We will learn more about, how, about these developments today and together we, with the response of FEMA to the recent quakes. For those of you who are following this event online, Please, you can join this conversation by using the hashtags NYUDC and DC Dialogues, okay? So we are very grateful because you are here. Thank you very much for being here. And now let's just meet our speakers for today's discussion. Nate Mook is the CEO of World Central Kitchen, known as WCK. Here he works hand in hand with the nonprofit's founder, a very well-known activist and humanitarian chef, Jose Andres. Nate oversees all WCK operations, leading the organization's emergency and disaster relief efforts, as well as well its long-term impact projects. He for formally joined WCK after helping to create and lead the Chefs for Puerto Rico effort in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria that served nearly four million meals to people in need. We will begin with a short video followed by Nate's remarks. We were all eating and then it starts shaking. Come on, 
Well, that, that was a very moving video. So now we are going to give the floor to Nate. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Um, I know I'm behind this podium, but I think I have to speak into the mic, so in case they're, they're recording. So um, otherwise I'd, I'd come out in front. But um, so I'm Nate, uh, I'm the, the CEO of World Central Kitchen, as uh, Giovanni mentioned. Um, I've uh, known Jose Andres for, for about 10 years now, and um, what some people don't know is that World Central Kitchen um, has now been around about 10 years. Uh, the organization was formed in the aftermath of the earthquake in Haiti. Um, Jose uh, was, was a chef and a rest restaurateur, and some of you have probably been to, to his restaurants here in, in Washington, D.C. And he went down to Haiti to see how he as a chef could bring his expertise with food uh, to help solve some of the challenges that the country was facing after the devastating earthquake in, in 2010. Um, and what he found was that not only was there, was there a place for, for what he could bring to the table, but that um, chefs in general, this, this industry that he was part of and the expertise that, that he had built over the years uh, could be applied to solve some major challenges that the world faces. Um, so he started small. Uh, we uh, built a bakery and an orphanage in Port-au-Prince. We opened a culinary school in Haiti that's, that to this day uh, trains uh, dozens of young men and women to go into the hospitality sector. Um, and sort of project by project, Jose learned about ways that he could apply his expertise to, to some of these challenges he was seeing. And over the years, he started to find himself in disaster zones as well. Uh, up in New York after Hurricane Sandy hit, when Hurricane Matthew hit Haiti and uh, the Carolinas, he went down there and started to learn, a lot of learning going on. And things sort of culminated in 2017 when Category 5 Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. And many people began hearing about Jose and his work uh, from that point. So just a, a, some quick backstory. Uh, Jose and I flew down to Puerto Rico just a couple of days after the hurricane had, had left the island. So this is about three, four days after, after it, it, had, it had started hitting and sort of went all the way diagonally across Puerto Rico. And we didn't really have any agenda. It wasn't like we went down and we said, we're gonna go feed millions of, of people um, you know, we sort of went down thinking we're going to be there for a few days, see how we could help out. I'm sure they've got everything under control. This is the United States. Um, you know, FEMA's there. Things are going to be okay. And we got on the ground, and the first thing we did was we, we headed over to FEMA headquarters, and we sort of checked in and, and said, okay, well, you know, how are things going? Uh, there was a lot of concern at this point about fuel, access to fuel. There were like 12-hour gas lines at the gas stations, and um, we were very concerned about, about that piece. And so we asked, who's, who's handling the food? You know, we're about four days after, after Maria at this point. Um, you can imagine probably, you know, in your own homes how much food you probably have on hand, how long you can get by. Perhaps some of you are thinking more about this now as the United States has announced that the coronavirus may come here and 
are warning people to start stocking up on some things. But you can think, you know, for an unexpected event, you know, how, how long can you typically last feeding yourself out, out of what's in your house? And usually that's probably 72 hours, right? I mean, once you get day three, four, maybe you've got chips in your pantry, you can kind of munch on stuff, but like real food without going to the grocery store, without going to restaurants. And at this time in Puerto Rico, there was no banks, no electricity, no communication, no, no grocery stores were open. So really we're at this moment of humanitarian crisis that, that, that we were looking at. And so we asked, well, who's in charge of the food? Nobody had an answer. Um, FEMA didn't have an answer. Uh, everybody was paralyzed with the scale of the disaster that had just struck Puerto Rico. The local government in Puerto Rico was overwhelmed. A lot was put onto the mayors of the towns in Puerto Rico um, that really sort of stepped into this role because they were kind of left alone. Uh, so we went and talked to FEMA and we said, well, you know, what, what can be done? They said, well, we have about 2 million people that need to be fed in Puerto Rico right now, we estimate. So if you're doing three, mil three meals a day, that's 6 million meals a day we have to produce and we have no idea how to do it. So, uh, we said, well, you know what, let's, let's just start small because, uh, you know, clearly there's paralysis coming in from the top of support. So what can we do? What, what can the Puerto Rican people do to serve themselves in this, in this moment? Uh, and, that's, and that's where it all began. Uh, we started, uh, went to a friend's restaurant in San Juan, started cooking 1,000 meals a day. That went to 2,000, 4,000, 10,000, 12,000 and slowly grew. We started in this tiny little restaurant. We moved into the parking lot. We eventually moved into the Coliseum where that kitchen alone was producing about 75,000 meals a day. We then went on to open uh, 26 kitchens across the island. We had about 20,000 volunteers that participated in the effort. And I think what's really important about this and why I bring this up is because Jose is a big personality as you've probably seen him. And he's on the news, he's on Anderson Cooper. There's a lot of attention and Jose, you're feeding everybody. But Jose will be the first one to tell you that it wasn't Jose that was feeding Puerto Rico, it was Puerto Ricans that were feeding Puerto Rico, right? They were found themselves in this moment where they had to, had to step up and support themselves. So sure, we went in and, and provided that sort of structure and, and organization, but we couldn't have cooked and delivered four million meals across the island um, without the Puerto Rican people being leading the way. So we haven't left Puerto Rico. Um, we've, we've stayed over the past couple of years. We have, uh, we, we were cooking for, for about nine months and then we began looking at how we can support food security on the island. And we've built an amazing team there and the team that even cooked in Puerto Rico has gone on as World Central Kitchen's work has taken us all around the world. Um, we're currently in, in eight uh, we have eight ongoing operations, including Japan right now for the, for the coronavirus. Um, and many Puerto Ricans from our team have also gone out to the Bahamas, to Florida, to North Carolina to serve, uh, to serve others um, using their experience from Maria. And so uh, just over a month ago, about a month and a half ago, my phone rang at five in the morning and it was our team in Puerto Rico and immediately when I saw the phone ring at five in the morning, I knew what had happened. Um, Puerto Rico had a, had a bit of a smaller earthquake in December. So we were sort of on edge about, you know, what's gonna happen if there's a bigger one. And I knew the only reason anybody was calling me from Puerto Rico at five in the morning was because there was an earthquake. So I got on the phone, I said, you know, we know what we have to do. And the Puerto Rican team on the ground mobilized. It's about five in the morning by Seven in the morning, we were in the kitchen. By 8 a.m., we were cooking, and by 11 a.m., the first meals were out the door to some of the shelters and the, the camps that, that you saw in that video. Um, and so I'll close just with a quick update on, on the situation. We're still cooking in, in Puerto Rico in the south right now. Uh, we've served nearly 400,000 meals since the earthquake hit. Um, our teams uh, led by many of the Puerto Ricans that were with us during Hurricane Maria um, including some of our amazing food trucks and chefs have been cooking um, every day and serving. We, there's still uh, the formal shelters that are open. The National Guard set up these shelters, they came in. Um, but we knew that we had to move quickly, that the only way for this response to happen effectively when people are hungry 
you know, you, you, you don't have days, you don't have weeks, you don't have months, you have hours before you need to get things to people. And so we knew we couldn't rely on, unfortunately, um, you know, our, our federal government to get there as quickly as possible. Um, but the National Guard set up these camps after about a week and families that were living in sort of informal tents moved into the shelters and, and to this day um, we're serving and thankfully the shaking has lessened now. Um, as you saw in this video, one of the big challenges is the traumatic experience. Um, you don't know what's gonna happen next and imagine you're elderly, you live in the second floor of a home, you can't get out quickly enough, you have young, young children, um, people just didn't want to go back to their homes if there was gonna be more earthquakes. So things are starting to stabilize a little bit. Um, so we'll see, hopefully things will continue to improve and, and um, I'm sure uh, Mayor is, is gonna speak uh, more about this, but uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you, Bye. thank you for being here. Well, Thank you very much for your remarks, your perspectives, and for being here. So uh, now we will continue with remarks from Mayor of Ponce, Maria Mayita Melendez. She has been mayor since 2009. During her administration as mayor, she has led recovery efforts following major natural disasters and overseen five signature infrastructure projects under the Ponce Avanza Initiative worth $177 million. Here is a brief video ahead of the mayor's remarks. Ponce is strong. So we are very lucky to have the mayor of Ponce join us today, especially, as you know, the mayor in Puerto Rico have been the first responders during natural disasters, joined by organizations such as WCK. So thank you very much. I'm not so tall like this guy, but I'm a strong woman. Yeah, 
Uh, hello, good afternoon to every one of you. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And uh, thanks to the NYU officials for giving me the opportunity to have an open discussion about the response to the natural uh, disasters that have been affected us in Puerto Rico. I appear before you, as always, with my heart in my hand and my head held up high. At the outset, I must recognize the work that has been done by my friend, Jose Andres, Nate Mook, team at the same, at the same time, Till Coin, at the same time to uh, Josh Svelts and Russell, who is there over there, uh, and many other chefs from Puerto Rico, and they are from here, but we have to be thankful and grateful for all the work that our, not only our brothers and sisters from mainland has helped Puerto Rico. I must recognize at the same time that on behalf of all the people of Puerto Rico and Ponce, we have to thank not only Malin, FEMA, even though the president of the United States will approve things at the same time, even though we have been after two years waiting for Pony uh, to reconstruct the island, as soon as this week they began uh, to send us the, the money, not because of corruption of the city, not because of corruption of the governor of Puerto Rico, that there were two guys from FEMA who did the corruption area and have found uh, that they mislead and other things, not Puerto Rico. Uh, our time of great needs, you have given us hope. At the same time, fed our bodies and souls and have demonstrated the transformation, power and sacrifice and service. You know, I have been a, uh, a dentist for 34 years and you have been, uh, maybe I will ask, a may, uh, she, she was a dentist and now a mayor. I am in my third term, our terms uh, last for four years. So I am in my, in my third term as a mayor because my passion is to serve the people. It's my fashion. I have two uh, daughters, they are lawyers. One is a secretary of political uh, studies in the staff of the governor of Puerto Rico. She's a lawyer for 15 years, she has been a lawyer. The other one is a lawyer at the same time. Both are like my mother and daughter because they fight for the people. They fight to get people services and get everything they need. As you know, the last few years have been very challenging for the American citizens of Puerto Rico because we are American citizens like you are. And during these events, public figures are encountered and encouraged oh, uh, today us to convey an image of infallibility turning us into medical fissures. Some heroes, others are villains, and in the process sometimes, perspective about our reality is lost. We are imperfect, we're humans. Yet this vulnerability should not be viewed cynically, but rather as a source of strength, determination, passion, there lies out humanity, and we are humans. There, therein lies our ability to emphasize this dynamic has not been determined, no, but reinforce my deepest love for my city, for my people, for the vocation of public service even though I was a dentist for 34 years in a private practice. If you didn't have money to pay, I don't care. I did the service for you. That's the way I was uh, educated for my family. Each crisis is different. I mean, the struggle of reconstruction process from Hurricane Maria has been very difficult. My last community and, and my city it's the second largest city in territorial extension in Puerto Rico. We are in the south, so our coast is with the Caribbean Sea. In the north is the Atlantic Ocean. 
So we are in the south, and it's a big city in the south, and it's a regional city because we have many uh, agencies from the central government represented in Ponce. We have had to face the disaster of Maria, whose nature and impact are entirely different of an earthquake. While we constantly hear that the island has been hit by a few earthquakes, the, rea the reality is that the people of the southern coast of the island have had to endure thousands of earthquakes and tremors during the past months and a half. Yesterday, yesterday, I called my uh, emergency management director and I asked him, because every day we check it, every day we check it, and he said, how many quakes has been occurred? And he said to me, Mayor, 15. Uh, in the ritual scale, it's about uh, 3.2, 3.0, 2.2, and, and he said to me, and he said to me, and, and I called him just a few minutes ago, and I said to him, how many times since this morning there have been quakes? And he said, about eight earthquakes, eight. The, the largest one was about, uh, in the scale of reach, at about 3.2. Since December 28, the big one occurred in January 7, in the 7th. But you know, Puerto Rico has a large Christmas, large vacations in Christmas. So we have the Trickings Day in uh, January the 6th, and people become at work again at uh, January the 8th. So in January the 7th, we were hit by the, by the uh, earthquake with Saints Point 4, and it was awful. It was awful. It was uh, four four thirty in the morning. I left just uh, in two minutes in the office of the emergency management office over there, and I began to work. I have to tell you at the same time that I uh, I was uh, I suffered uh, a medical intervention um, an operation and uh, in December. And I was supposed to be in bed one one and a half month, and and um, uh, my my intervention was it uh, the 19 of December, so I only was uh, in bed for 19 days, and I called the doctor and said I have to work, I have to go out, I have to help my people, I have to take care of them. That's one of the reasons that mayors and people that are elected by you. We make a swarm, but to work for the people. So I said to my daughters, I'm sorry, I have to work and keep working. And until today, I have been working at the same time. And I'm, and I'm still in, in treatment. But even though I am strong, we are strong, and we have to fight for our people. Uh, what we constantly hear that the island has been hit, and I said, it is a different way of feeling an earthquake and a different way to feel at the same time uh, uh, a hurricane. Sometimes, I'm sorry, but sometimes my, 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 my voice is closed because I would like to cry and I cannot cry. But we are not uh, emotionally at the same time strong. Because sometimes, uh, when you when you see the people outside living outside in a car because they don't want to get inside a house because they they will think that the the roof will fall really uh, makes us worry. I, I said to you that well we have 43 school in Ponce, 43 school, and only 11 school has just begun, and it's in a private center convention that is owned by the municipality, and we had 11 schools in interlocking time. In the morning, uh, five group, and in the afternoon, six group. Uh, the students from high school are supposed to begin this week in, the, uh, in a branch of the University of Puerto Rico in Ponce. For us, it has become a daily occurrence that 
understandably, as an undeniable emotional effects in our people. People are emotionally affected. There are scars. There are scars because we don't feel secure because every time it's shaking. And we can feel it. We can feel it. Even though it don't last too much, but we can feel it. And in a sense, this is the biggest challenge that we, that we face. While there are objective criteria to address material loss, it is quite different to deal with the emotional scars of an unpredictable event. Because we don't know when we, we, when we will happen a, an earthquake. Hundreds of people have taken to open public spaces each night for fear of a ceiling collapse during their sleep. Um, weeks ago, now I still have one shelter, one shelter, and we call satellite shelter the people who live in tarps. We prepare a tarp outside, in street, in any place, because people live there. During the night, they stay, during the night, during the day, they stay at their homes. But during the night, they sleep in their car and the tarps. They use the car, put it in the tar in the tarps, and they stay all the night. All people, family, whole families completely. And and I have to tell that uh, the law makes us that the mayors only can give food by the Department of Education to the people who are in the shelter recognized by the government. Who assign the shelter is uh, the Department of Housing and the Department of Education to the mayors. We are not the one who decide. It's the Department of, of Education and the Department of Housing of the central government is the one who decide. So they give us one shelter. We even have 24 satellite shelters, people living outside. And we cannot stand that there were people having no lunch, no uh, uh, at the same time meal without war central kitchen. They did the job. Those satellite shelters that not were recognized by the central government, they gave us the food. And I told the governor of Puerto Rico, who is a new governor, is a woman. Uh, she, she became governor, you know what happened with Governor Rosselló. He has been taken out and he resigned. And this woman, I told her, I told her war central Christians are the ones that we have to thank. Not only the Department of Education, that, who is now taking charge of the church that are being recognized, but war central kitchen, with Jose Andres, with Nate, with Tom, with, with Tim, with Josh, were the ones who gave us the food. Even though the National Guard, FEMA came over there, even though they were there, they were fed by, by these people. And we didn't pay them, we didn't pay not a cent to them. So we have to be very grateful to them. Hundreds of people have been taken to open public spaces each night for fear of ceiling collapse during their sleep. Most of the people have a home with no apparent damage. We understand the concerns of emotional burden of the people. I also shudder every time the earth shakes. Unlike Maria, in a short time, the great majority of the town had access to basic service. In, in less than 48 hours, we have power. We had, uh, at the same time, water. After Maria, no. After Maria, many months, we didn't have water, nor even have, uh, at the same time, nor energy. So the basic service, the health services system were functioning, a large portion of the private sector has restored its operation. And the community, the people who are volunteers from every place came to that, those five cities. In the South, we were affected five cities at the first time. It was Guanica, uh, Guanica maybe there are about 15,000 people living, 15,000. The other one is Yauco, they have 33,000 people living, population. The other was uh, 22,000 is Peñuelas, and the other one was uh, 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 Guayanilla. A small town is about uh, 17,000 people. And Ponce, who has 
134,000 people living. So it's the biggest one. The delivery of supply, uh, I, I have to tell you, for example, a property, a, what after the, after, after the earthquake, what happened? How we can go, go home again if they were checked? If every time there was seismic moving, they have to check again. We have about uh, uh, 1,516 uh, 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 so, uh, areas that we ask for help. 1,000 people, 516 people were asking, families, families asking for help. Up to now, almost 400 are collapsed and are destroyed. But the biggest city that has high buildings, I have said in high, high buildings. Uh, for example, uh, there, should, there, there are places as condominiums for uh, elders people. At the same time, we have all the municipality buildings. I have 17 buildings in the municipality that uh, are damaged at the same time. I had uh, uh, more than 200 houses that, that has to be destroyed. And uh, every time the, the uh, structural engineers go and check every house, they put a, a cross. If it is red, it has to be destroyed. If it is yellow, it has to be fixed before leaving again. And if it's green, you can go back again. But people are afraid to live on the resilience. So uh, the logistical problem of this cannot be minimized. The delivery of supply has been complicated for the sector of the population that has chosen to take refugee in public areas that are not certified, as I said, or inspected, and where there are great limitations on legal impediment to provide certain request resources. If you don't have a permit, or if you don't own your own house, or you don't have those papers, it will be difficult for FEMA to help you. That's one of the problems. We also have to, have to work uh, with people from the municipality and others who unfortunately take advantage of the event to abandon their family members, particularly elderly, in shelters. I have seen a daughter, a son, taking his mother, his grandfather, and said to Take care here, please, of them in the shelter and let them. We are humans. My mother died one year and a half. She was 93 years old, but I take care of her. My sister take care of them. We are, we're taking care of the elderly people. And we should teach our kids and these young guys from the university, from college, that they have to take care also of elderly people. It's important because sometimes I get there to the shelter and they said to me, help me, please. Give me peace. I really makes us cry when we saw those things that people felt at home. Please know that we still face many challenges from a, from a governmental response perspective during this, during the crisis, we began to implement many of the protocols and process developed after Maria. I have to tell that the new governor of Puerto Rico, attorney Wanda Vasquez, has been doing a great job. In 48 hours, she brought out the energy, she brought out the water, she came to the south as many times as she, as, as she could visit in, in, in the whole week. She went to every place. We were five cities that were hit but now they had included more than 10 more cities from the mountains and to the west coast at the same time. Some of these uh, emergency, some, some of the protocols were ineffective, were ineffective. And the sum of the process, we even though theoretically require rethinking and made a new ones, we present, Ponce present a plan for earthquake many months ago, but the commissioner who was in charge didn't do did a great job. He have a, a, a warehouse in Ponce with supplies. 
a mere mayor I didn't know. We didn't know. And many of the mayors in the South didn't know. And he didn't tell us. The first person who helped me, because the, the second night, I have more than 1,800 people living in a shelter. And they were sleeping in the floor. Because the emergency management commander didn't have the, uh, the couches so that people can sleep. And I asked him several times, where do I can get those coach? I need it right now. Fill the form 113. I fill the form. We fill the form. We did as they said. And you know, those couches were in Ponce. And he didn't tell us. He sent me to another city about one hour and a half from Ponce to look for those and help the other cities. Even though we are in those cities from different opponent political parties, we didn't care about politics. I am not caring just now even though it's, it's election time. I am caring about my people and help my other mayors. I came here to DC to see congressmen and congresswomen so they can approve in the Senate an, an, uh, an aid, a supplemental aid for the disaster because we are worried about, because we need that money to reconstruct ho the whole island. We have to demolish many areas at the same time. But even though so, we're doing business. Ponce has an airport, Ponce has a, a port, and Ponce is a brick region. Even though we are a colonial and historical city, there are places that are open, there are places that are closed. But we're still open, and we're still doing business. Uh, Why theoretically adequate require rethinking is that I said, one of these aspects is the communication. Communication is important when there is a disaster. After Maria, we didn't have phones, no function, no satellite phone function, no energy, no, and, and we cannot communicate, not even from the north to the south, from the south to the east, or the south to the west, no. But after the earthquake, 48 hours we have it. But communication is important, and coordination of all the emergency disasters. My recommendation, take courses. Make your mayor or make your, your council or make your senators or representatives to explain to you in a school, in college, in every place. Talk about earthquake. How do we prepare for an earthquake? I have my, my backpack with everything. And my, and my satellite phones. And I, I take it to every place I move. There is water, there are medicine for safety. There are many things. There are food also at the same time that have to be checked. Brian always with my backpack in my car on every place I go. I really, however, I must recognize the tireless effort of thousands of citizens and public officials that are helping us overcome many of these difficulties. World Central Kitchen, I don't have a way to thank them. I don't have a way. It's only talking about people, what a great job they have done in 10 years, what a great job they have done after Maria hit Puerto Rico, after it hit Virgin Island, as the Bahamas suffered from a hurricane at the same time. IT, we have to be thankful to this to these guys. They have been, they have been done an excellent work. I must recognize also at the same time uh, the work and the uh, uh, ability to coordinate with all stakeholders. As I have stated consistently, it is essential that we work collaboratively. We have to collaborate with everyone. If there is someone in your neighborhood who needs help, help them. It's important. With the third sector is one, the religious sector, the third sector, community sectors, poor sectors, and the federal government. I have to be thankful for the federal government. Why not? They really help, has helped us. Without mainland, we cannot do it, my friends. We cannot do it. Precisely, they are, they are, that is why I am in DC. This week, I have been continuing developing policies that threaten our capacities and fight for the rights as need of the American citizens of Puerto Rico. 
while we appreciate the assistance that has been given, the rate of response has to be commensurate with the nature of the event. FEMA cannot let red tape, bureaucracy, an impediment to recovery. But we follow federal rules. In Ponce, we have used more than 500,000 millions of dollars during 25 years. And no, and, and we had not been said that we had any finding. We, had, we didn't have any finding in those federal money. We continue in this endeavor with sensitivity and with the impetus as always. Hurricane Maria and the earthquakes have shaken us hard, but our foundations are immovable and came to serve my people. Together, together, mainland Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, everyone in the world, together, we have to serve people. And together, we will recover as we have done in the past. Ponce is strong, we are strong. American citizens are strong. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mayor Melendez. Thank you for the wonderful words and for sharing your insights on the crisis in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and the recent earthquake. So now, last but not least, please allow me to introduce our last panelist, Mr. Gregorio Igartua followed by a dialogue between the panelists, as well as questions and answers from the audience. Gregorio Igartua, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. He is a lawyer, CPA, too, and he has contributed to mul multiple judicial processes, claiming the democratic rights of the American citizens, citizens of Puerto Rico. And recently, he appeared before the Human Rights Commission of the Organization of American States, demanding recognition of these fundamental rights for the American people of Puerto Rico. Thank, Thank you, you for Giovanni being here. And hi to everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So let's start off with our first question. And this one goes to Nate. Again, thank okay. you for being here. Thank so you. what are some challenges that you encountered when preparing meals for thousands of people, people in Puerto Rico, especially during Hurricane Maria and the recent el earthquake? Yeah, I, I think there's sort of two, two distinct sets of challenges. One of them is the uh, logistical challenges of how you feed that many people in, in a time of crisis um, and identify those that, that are in need. Uh, you know, a lot of people have asked us, well, where, you know, after Hurricane Maria, where, where did you get the food? Where did you find food? Your FEMA couldn't get food in. Where did you guys get food? And, um, you know, it seems such a silly question for a chef to ask a chef where he finds food. I mean, we, uh, we, you go to where the food is. You go to the food distributors on the island. You, you identify the right partners, the kitchens, the, the resources to activate. And so, you know, very quickly we were able to establish a supply chain to get food coming in, whereas a lot of the public assistance was, was stuck at the port uh, or couldn't get through, uh, relying heavily on the private sector. Um, and that's really kind of at the core of, of, of the model of, of the re response that we have. So there's the logistical challenges that you really have to rely on the local community. You tap into the expertise of the people, the mayors who know their communities and the right people that know the neighborhoods and the areas that, that are hit the hardest. Um, I remember going down to, to Ponce for the first time after Maria in 2017 and uh, talking to uh, the mayor and her administration about the areas that that probably needed the most assistance. She said, "Well, you know, you need to to go to uh, El Tuque, which is which is outside of of Ponce, a little bit to the west." And so we drove in, and and as we we sort of had a, a bit of a caravan of all of our vehicles and food, and people ran out and they were like, "FEMA, FEMA's here!" We said, "No, no, no, we're not FEMA, um, but we do have food for you." And they and and it was wonderful, and the community came together. We set up a, an area and started serving. We were the first people they had seen since the hurricane had hit. Um, but we wouldn't have known that if not for working closely with the, the, the community itself and, and the mayors in the towns that, that, we, were, that we were serving. The second challenge is, um, is the red tape, um, you know, in these types of situations. Uh, you know, you, 
you want to have a coordinated response. You want to leverage the resources that um, the U.S. government can bring to the table. Uh, you have the National Guard. You have military. You have, um, you know, the the financial resources of of the U.S. government. But too often in these situations, you end up with individuals on the ground who are really wonderful individuals. The the employees of FEMA and others that we met in the early days were trying very hard and they, they wanted to do great work, um, but they found themselves stuck and unable to, to move quickly enough. Um, they were unable to do, to take the smart approach. And, and one example I'll give you is, you know, we very quickly were able, working with the community and the, and the resources that were there, get a, a hot meal uh, operation up and going on the island. The, the only large scale uh, operation that was preparing hot meals, we were delivering. We had mayors and, and municipalities driving two, three hours to come to our kitchen to pick up thousands of meals to take back to their communities to feed some of the elderly and the folks that, that were, were really um, in tough places. Uh, so it would make sense to scale up that operation. Um, and this is what, what Jose and I tried to do. Um, but there wasn't really a mechanism to do that. The folks on the ground didn't have a, have a way to support uh, what was already happening. And so while we were sort of struggling for support, um, even if it was just logistical support, even if it was just help us get more food in or help us deliver over here, um, you know, w while that was going on and we were struggling, uh, you know, FEMA was uh, in the middle of, of signing a, a $50 million contract with a food, with a catering company out of Atlanta run by one person who had no capability to deliver any food or get food to Puerto Rico. But you find, you know, this, uh, after that came out in the news, they canceled the contract, it became a big thing, but it, you know, you sort of recognize then sort of the system working against itself and the people on the ground that are really great human beings. And so what we found, um, which is, which, which I want to end with, which is very important, is that Oftentimes, the, the most productive um, and efficient way to work is one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. uh, so, or in these sort of moments where decisions can just be made in real time without having to go up the chain um, of command and get certain approval. We were there on the ground the first couple of days in Puerto Rico. We met some guys from Homeland Security, from Homeland Security Investigations. They work along the border, part of DHS. And they were there to kind of provide security and safety and also to go out to parts of the island to do wellness checks. And so we said, well, you've got this fleet of SUVs, probably 30 or 40 SUVs, and you're driving all over the island um, for DHS. How about we give you food to take with you? And then when you go out there, you can hand out food to the communities. And the local, the, the, the individuals who were, who were there, the, the agents, the special agents on the ground said, yeah, that sounds good. We're, we're just going to do it. They didn't make a phone call. They didn't ask anybody. They didn't, you know, try. They just said, yeah, that's great. So every day they would drive to our kitchen. We'd fill up their trucks, and they would drive all across the island. And they became one of our delivery arms. But if we had tried to sort of go from the top down, it would have really been impossible. So I think, you know, as we're looking at, at what can be done, I think you really have to um, sort of identify those bottlenecks and what can you do to empower the good work that's happening? How do you empower the local leaders, the mayors and the, the community leaders that, and you know, not with, withhold from them, not have warehouses full of things that they don't even know about or can access, right? I mean, how do you empower them? Because they're the ones that are really gonna be able to serve and know, and know what the communities need most. Thank you. I think you mentioned something very Im important. I mean, very, very interesting when you said about um, red tape, for example. I think that that's something that is really critical, instrumental when it comes to helping people, especially when it comes to helping people. So now, Gregorio, how are you? How are you? Fine, thank you. Thank you. So uh, how you you were you were in Puerto Rico during these major disasters, these major natural disaster, so you experienced this firsthand. How was the response to the recent earthquakes different from the hurricanes? Well, what I would like to say is that uh, the, the every discussion uh, must begin with, with Maria, because both from a governmental point of view and from a citizen's point of view, from a policy point of view, uh, Maria was such a traumatic event, and we invested so much in developing protocols and 
uh, developing an infrastructure to deal with a crisis. And we were, in a sense, uh, uh, once this ex uh, event happened, in a sense, we, we, we tried to pour all that in into this experience. And yet, uh, the earthquakes, earthquakes are quite different from Maria, from a hurricane. So, so although we have uh, all, uh, developed all these protocols and we had all these good uh, uh, ideas, uh, it was difficult at first to apply them to this specific um, um, event. And from the people's point of view, it's the same. You know, you have to to start from Maria because their patient has patients has have be, has been tested. They don't want to go through the same. So their reaction and their availability to deal with uh, government officials and 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 all um, emergency plans come from that point of view. They they just don't want to go through that again, and and it has been quite um, difficult. Uh, I would say uh, to establish a coherent response in certain ways just because of that. We are still developing protocols and still developing uh, the, the right mix uh, uh, of policies to address not just a hurricane, which we are more used to, uh, but all kinds of, 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 of natural disasters, you know. And that's, that has been the difficulty, at least from my point of view, um, that you cannot have uh, a set of rules, uh, a one-size-fits-all set of rules for everything. And, and in a way, we always have a tendency to do that. Uh, and that brings upon a, a big challenge. Uh, but we are still learning. Um, we don't want to have these type of types of events, but we're still learning. And they do help in, in, in addressing these issues, particularly communication. Communication is essential at all levels. And you know that's always one of the biggest problems. Even even when you plan for it, uh, since the events are different, the role players, are the, the the stakeholders are different, uh, the participants are different. Uh, we have to constantly uh, have an infrastructure or an ecosystem that quickly adapts and adjusts uh, to the situations. And that's why uh, the third sector is so so important because the 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 officials, uh, governmental official officials in a democracy change, and all of them do not have the expertise. You have experts in certain areas, but they don't have the expertise that sometimes the third sector has in, in a wider array of, of, of events and, and circumstances. That's very true. That's why we have to bring together the entire community, especially you know, like having partnerships in the third sector is very important in cases like these. So and I think that uh, when it comes to, to these kind of events, Puerto Ricans are very used to having hurricanes, but this time was very different. So, Mayor, I have a question for you. Let, let me tell you this. Every six months, by June the 1st to December the 1st, is the time of hurricane season. Hurricane season. June the 1st through December the 1st. Is a hurricane season in the Caribbean islands in Puerto Rico. That's true. And what is it like managing a city during times of crisis? How do you prepare for something like this? Well, first of all, I, I have to tell you that the first thing I is in my mind is uh, how are my daughters and their husband and, and my grand uh, my granddaughter uh, are they okay? But. Uh, I, I couldn't get any, any communication on the first one because uh, electricity was off and, and uh, at the same time the, the systems were that are owned by the, the central government were off. So I, I dress myself and I, I, and I get out, but I, it is important that one, coordination, communication, you have to take courses, experiences that during these years I have passed and I, I have come uh, to many, many uh, uh, curses that have been given by the emergency system, by the hurricane uh, system, and we taught, we every mayor, every mayor has to make plans for earthquake, have to make plans with emergency director management, and at the same time, uh, it's difficult we, because we have to take care of everyone. And 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 as I as as I get dressed that, that night, 
uh, that morning, it was 4.30 in the morning, and, and, and I live across the uh, emergency management office, and I take the director, is everything is okay? There are, there are, are there, there are people that, that are uh, at the same time affected. Just tell me, tell me what you have in your phone. But uh, we call immediately, we have a, a, a group that uh, is in at the same time that uh, when there is a disaster, they have to appear in the emergency system the office at the same time. 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, so every, Every director of every department in my municipality has to be there. And being gone, all the works. Have to take care of the roads, how to clean the roads. If there are persons who are uh, at the same time affected, if there are deaths, if there are people that, uh, that their, their, their roof collapsed and, and they are uh, over there. So we have to take care of everyone. And our plans that uh, immediately by the health department, uh, by the health department, the shelter that we, ha we have to open immediately so people can move into the shelter and take out every person out of those high buildings. So experience is one of the, the determination that we have to make. At the same time, the passion of, of, of determination and the passion of, of doing things that we are the one who have to take care of the people but we are the leaders, so we have to be prepared. We are not even prepared for a disaster, but we have to take many courses at the same time. We have many meetings to go, many meetings with the community, and, and stay with the community wh what you lack. For example, after Maria, we prepare, uh, I have 300 communities in Ponce. I prepare 365 persons from different communities in first aid, in communication, in massification of food, and at the same time in laws that has to be legal areas at the same time. I, I, uh, we, we teach them and train them for six months. Now we are in our third group of 300 members of, of, the, of the third party of the, of the community, different community. They know how to get the first help. They, they, they become the first responder because you cannot wait for the central government to come. Because I haven't seen, for example, when Maria hits uh, Ponce, I, I saw the governor three weeks uh, after Maria. After Maria. Now after the, the, the earthquake, I saw the governor 24 hours after. She came and she began to give instructions and doing things with all the departments and agencies that were from the central government. But you have to be prepared. You have to make coordinations. You have to make decisions. You are the leader. And you have to make, at the same time, at the same time, uh, uh, simulacros. I would say simulacros in, in, in English as uh, trails. Trails. Tra trails. Safety drills. Uh, have to make trails in different kinds. If a hurricane, because hurricane can pass and you can work. But the earthquake, after one month and a half, is still shaking. It's still shaking. So experience is one of the things. And taking care of people, taking every course you can go and visit and talk to the community, that's very important. And empower, empower your community. That's one of the things. Well, thank you very much for your comments. Um, this question goes to Nate. So please tell us about World Central Kitchen's future plans for its Cloud to Plate initiative um, programs in Puerto Rico. Yeah, so I, I alluded to this in the, in the opening. Um, you know, we recognized uh, after uh, cooking uh, for, for many months after Maria, um, you know, looking at why did we have to cook in the first place, right? Why, what was the, the, the situation? And, you know, one of the challenges that um, Puerto Rico faces is it was it was importing roughly about 90% of its food uh, onto the island before uh, the hurricane hit. Um, and this is not unique to Puerto Rico. I mean, if you look at the U.S. Virgin Islands, if you look at other Caribbean nations, you know, we live in such a globalized uh, society now that it's, it's often cheaper uh, to just import things from somewhere else where there might be subsidies or cheaper labor. And you end up with with uh, loca locations, cities, countries, states um, that are not very resilient on their own. Um, I mean, I think uh, 
we're starting to see this now as, as manufacturing in China has now been shut down for so long, and, and I think this is gonna be a ripple effect. Um, you know, and uh, we're seeing how vulnerable we are when we rely on, on the outside. So, especially when it comes to food, uh, this is a major problem because if Puerto Rico is importing all of its food regularly and relying on the ships coming in, bringing the food, and you have an event, uh, a hurricane, flooding, whatever it might be that's disrupting that chain, uh, all of a sudden now you, you don't have any food anymore on the shelves to stock the shelves. And this is what we saw happen during Maria for, uh, for many weeks. It took the system a long time to sort of reboot and get back to normal um, as, as things got repaired. So as part of our work, you know, we're looking at, we, we don't sort of just drop in somewhere and, and do s and feed people and then, and then walk away. Um, if there is an opportunity for us to support for the long term, we, th that's what, what we want to do. And so we, we began a program that we call our Plata Plate program in Puerto Rico, um, where we committed uh, about $4 million over four years to invest in food security on the island. So supporting small farmers, um, uh, food businesses, fisheries, getting more local produce in into the local market. Um, there was never, you know, we see this in D.C., you've seen sort of the made in D.C. stuff and, and other things here. There really wasn't that in, in Puerto Rico. There wasn't sort of a, a pride in, in local Puerto Rican products, despite it being this incredible Caribbean nation that was so much potential. Um, and coffee is another great example of, of a huge opportunity in Puerto Rico. So um, we have about 100... Uh, Grantees, I don't like to call them grantees because they're they're really like partners of ours. They're not. We don't just give them money and walk away. They become part of part of uh, what we do. They become sort of part of our network, um, and uh, we invest in them um, not for for monetary gain or return, but for the growth of their businesses in support of of um, you know the future of of Puerto Rico. Um, so we've got about a hundred businesses now. We've got um, we've launched farmers markets all over the island. Uh, we've been able to, to really lift up some of these businesses um, to try to get them sort of between the small stage to, to the larger growth and then working with big buyers like Walmart on the island and um, also big hotel chains like Marriott to start sourcing more locally and getting the systems in place of reliability, of quality and things like that. And, and we saw this um, uh, really working during uh, the earthquake where we were able to start purchasing a lot of our produce from those local farms. So we weren't buying a lot of the produce, you know, from that was being brought in and imported, but we were buying these amazing lettuces and radishes and, and all sorts of, of greens from local Puerto Rican farms um, that were, you know, just, you know, minutes or hours away from, from, from Ponce. So, um, so that's so we're now taking that program and and going to be expanding it to more more places, including the Bahamas and others. But but really, the, the it started right there in in Puerto Rico. Sounds like you guys have big plans, so which is good. So we are all on the same page regarding the tremendous potential that Puerto Rico has. And from my perspective, I think Puerto Rico needs you know same same opportunities as any American citizen in the states and. And they need to be heard. They need to to be to be at the same you know uh, place, just like anyone else, because they are American citizens as well. So, Gregorio, what is the role or approach that the U.S. government has had in Puerto Rico over the last past the last years? Well, um, for us, uh, uh, you know, it's always a controversy controversial theme in a way because every everyone uh, thinks when we with that when we are talking about the relationship with the federal government that we are talking about politics uh, but in reality we're talking about everyday life you know uh, there's a logistical aspect to politics and to governmental participation you know we live uh, in an island that, that is part of the United States for a hundred and uh, 22 years almost now and uh, but we don't have representation here in DC. We do have a 
Jennifer Gonzalez, the resident commissioner, who has done a great job, but we don't have uh, voting representatives or senators. And that's, uh, you know, from a logistical point of view, the, the pro political process is like that. You need to have votes in order, in a certain way, to, to negotiate uh, your way around it. And, and obviously, that's a big challenge for Puerto Rico, uh, even though I'm not contesting if there's uh, goodwill or not, you know, it, it's not from a, uh, I don't want to get into the, uh, if it's intentional or not, but the reality is that even with all the good faith, uh, treatment has not been uh, equal to other places I in the United States. And that's, that's a fact, it's not a political or status issue. Uh, red tape uh, that was mentioned before, you know, we understand, uh, we've, I've dealt with uh, the government for quite a while now, and I understand uh, the need for measures that guarantee uh, the process uh, that the money is well spent, and, and the government has a right, the federal government does have a right to monitor uh, the money in Puerto Rico and how is it, it's used. And I don't think anybody in Puerto Rico opposes that. But the issue is that in a certain way, that has been used uh, like an excuse uh, that has had the effect at the very least of delaying the recovery from Maria. And you know, people get tired of talking about the same thing after a while. They think we are, oh, again with Maria, two years after that, but the reality is that we are still speaking about Maria because it hasn't been dealt with. You know, the money has been assigned. You, you've seen the newspapers, the money has been assigned, but, but red tape has, has become an impediment to recovery. That's a fact in Puerto Rico. The money has been assigned, it has not been disbursed. Sorry. Thank you very much for your comments. So uh, I just don't want to leave this place without asking this question. We need to wrap up pretty soon for the interest of time. And I'm gonna just leave this question open to anyone on this panel. And what is the role that Puerto Rico plays and could play in the future in the presidential elections of the United States? Well, let me tell you this. I am, I am not an expert in, in, in politics like he is an expert in politics, even though I am the mayor, but I am a doer. And but one of the things uh, I will say that uh, we have more than five million Puerto Ricanos here in, 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 in Maylin. And every representative or congresswoman, congressman should know that we have five million that can vote here. They cannot vote there. We can vote in a primary. I mean, that's stupid. As American citizens in Puerto Rico, we can vote in the primaries, but not in the election time. Not in the election time. But if they in the in the House of Representatives or in the in the Senate, uh, they don't help Puerto Rico. They know we will talk to every five millions of those members that are there, and we told them that we haven't received the the right the right uh, treatment that California, Texas, or or or, or Florida has in, in Puerto Rico. We are not treated equally, and we only want to be treated equally as American citizens. We're humans. Do you have any comments on that? I just want to add that, that obviously as American citizens, we want to have that, that uh, to participate in the process. We want a, a seat at the table, you know, that's very important, uh, the very least for a large portion of the population. And, and, and hopefully we will get that in the future. But until then, uh, I call upon all uh, our brothers and sisters, uh, to vote and, and to consider us when they are voting, consider the policies towards Puerto Rico, uh, regardless of your ideology. Thank you so much. Any final thoughts you want to share? You know, I, I think um, what's, what's very exciting to me about Puerto Rico is the opportunities that it presents, right? I mean, uh, Puerto Rico is often uh, sort of positioned as a problem for, for the, the US, um, you know, an economic problem, a burden. Um, after Maria, you know, the administration was sort of presented the problems of, of Puerto Rico. And I think that I hope that with, um, you know, some uh, 
improved insight into the potential that that we recognize as a country the great opportunity that that Puerto Rico offers. I mean, it's an incredible island. Uh, you know, in in the Atlantic and the Caribbean, uh, not only for uh, economically for commerce and for food and for for the culture that it brings to the table and and obviously the 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 connection to the many uh, Puerto Ricanos living here in on the mainland, but I think also just you know I think as a, a as an as an opportunity to uh, to show what what America really is all about at the end of the day that we are. You know, a nation that uplifts and that um, helps uh, progress, and and I think that you know, even when we have big disasters and and we stumble and and we need to come back. I mean, you know, coming back stronger is 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 the way we the way we we do right. I mean, um, we've seen this after after many disasters here in the United States um, in the mainland, and uh, so I I hope that we start to shift that, right? That we start to recognize it. And one of the things that we've been doing, one of the things that Jose has been doing, is just encouraging people to go visit, right? To just go down there. It's there direct flights from DCA. It's super easy to get down there. Um, it's cheap uh, to fly down. And uh, it's such a, such a special, special place to visit, whether you're in, in San Juan, whether you're out west uh, on the beaches, whether you're down south. Um, there's so much to see and so much to do. And so we're really, we, uh, my hope is that we can really start to, to shift that and, and visit and recognize and that our leaders, um, we just had a congressional delegation come down. Um, they visited some of our kitchens. They went, they, they were in Ponce. Um, and I think, you know, one of those big takeaways that I really hope to see is that, um, that it's exciting, that, that this is a really special, amazing place, and we should be proud that it's part of the United States, that it's part of America, um, and, and not as some, you know, sort of, sort of side, you know, si side people. So, uh, so that's, that's what I would say. I would say, you know, I, it's, it's a place that I fell in love with when I visited. Everybody I know who goes down there, um, it's a great time to go visit, uh, you know, despite reading about the earthquakes and the situation and the recovery, um, you know, go to the amazing, uh, places and restaurants and and the beaches and the hotels and everything and just enjoy enjoy it and and I and I think we're starting to see that a little bit. It was amazing when when uh, Lin Manuel Miranda went down and and uh, brought Hamilton down there. Um, many people flew down to the island. We're we're seeing you know kind of a, a. I hope there's a silver lining to Maria, right? To the to the to the destruction and the and the impact that it had on, on the island that it was a wake up call um, and r some renewed attention will you know, help, help kind of you know, get Puerto Rico to, to where it needs to be. It was certainly a wake up call. Let me tell you this, it is not really important in, in the physical infrastructure of buildings but in the nature, I mean uh, environment. Uh, we have to cultivate our earth at the same time. And that's important. We have many land in, bon in, in Ponce, in, in the in honor of Ponce. And there are farms that they teach us how to cultivate at the same time. And, and there are coffee, there are, are other things that we can be conscious of the nature infrastructure. It's very important, nature infrastructure. Thank you for sharing that. So let's give our wonderful panel a big round of applause. <laughs> Now let's turn to our, our audience for a few questions. Please, state your name and organization. We have two mics, one on each side, and if anyone has some difficulties standing, so we can get the mic to you. So we have one here. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me now? OK. So my question in particular is for the mayor of Ponce, Mayita. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I wanted to give a short preface to the audience who might not uh, know very much about Puerto Rico. But um, the mayor, Mayita Melendez, went on the radio to say that the people living in tents in the south were happy and content with the poor conditions that they received. And it's also important to recognize that the mayor has stated that she did not know anything about the supplies that were stored. So 
So what do you think is worse? Someone who is part of the new progressive party political machine is hiding supplies from her people with blood on her hands or somebody who claims to be a competent mayor and is unable to know what is even in her backyard. So my question for the mayor is when will you resign from your post to let somebody who actually cares about Ponceños help the community since you have done such a terrible job representing Ponceños and you have done a terrible job in recovery and while you're here parading around with meetings in Congress, people are still in tents. The municipality has not provided adequate plans for housing those people. And the central government, which you are a member of the party of Wanda Vasquez and Tomas Rivera Schatz, the new progressive party is a political mafia with blood on its hands. So my question to you is when will you resign? First of all, I came to politics just to serve the people. First of all, I am a health defender and I have been waiting for 11 years in Ponce. The second thing, when I get to Ponce uh, as a mayor, they didn't have a, a transportation, mass transportation system, a public mass transportation system. I established a free mass transportation system. At the same time, the Head Start uh, schools were schools uh, for 1,500 kids, but a political issue. The teachers were the one in charge in political from the, from the government that is opening from my uh, new progressive party. And I said, I cannot teach kids from three to four years about politics. We are going to train them how to study. We are going to train them manners. We are going to train them emotionally, technical and digital way, and we did it. We are the best, the best head start in Puerto Rico. And at the same time, we'll think that here in the state. And we have given every, uh, the last five years, we have been, uh, have $62 million, uh, $62 million for educating those kids in the Head Start. The other thing is that uh, the people that I said that was happy was when the governor, Wanda Vasquez, was to visit the 1,000 people. They were in the, no, the shelter was not a school. Shelters in Puerto Rico are schools, are schools. And uh, the first time they were in a school, but they were sleeping outside because they don't want to get beside uh, uh, the, using a, a roof as a ceiling, no, because they were afraid. Then we take the, to the to a to a base camp, a base camp that is established by the National Guard, and they live in cars, or they has air conditionings, or they has uh, uh, windmills, and they said when the governor said. How do you feel? And they say, we feel secure here because we are not inside buildings. That's one of the things they said. The second thing is that those warehouses are owned by the central government, my friend. The central government is one thing and the local municipalities are another thing. I am autonomous. I can make laws for my people. And we have made many systems in health. I have two buses, one those bus that goes to every camp, to every community, and give free, free services, free services. The second thing is that uh, a medical bus, we go to every community, free medical services at the same time. And then uh, the work, those warehouses were owned in a private area that is owned by the uh, Department of uh, Exportation and Commerce. Those are private areas. As a mayor, I cannot get inside any warehouse and say, open that up uh, because I want to see what is there. No, my friend. This is a private area, and that private area is owned by the central government, by the commander who was in charge of those things of the emergency system. When, I get the, the notice, when I get the notice, if the person who knows me knows that Mayita Melendez, if has known that there were a warehouse full of supplies, I haven't had to go to Cabo Rojo to look for couches. I haven't had to call the mayor of San Juan, who is from my opening party, to call her to bring me water and give water to Peñuelas, who is from my opening party, and give coaches to Yauco. No, I didn't know. And I, is the people who know me that I am an honest woman, I have never being signed by a finding, a federal finding or anything, I have been 
member, as a president of the American Dental Association in Puerto Rico. I have been president of many boards. And at the same time, only 40, 40 or 45 people who marched in front of the municipality to send me to, to resign. Only 40, 48 or 40, 50 people. When, when Ricardo Rosselló was the governor, there were millions of persons resigning. When Rosselló was the governor, people Excuse were not Thank you. Intense. Excuse me. We are, we are running out of time keeping today. the order here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. That's what democracy I would like. I would like to make a, a brief point. That's what democracy is all about. So we have a question here. And I think for the interest of time, Maybe you can add something after. No, no, I, I want to make a, a, brief, a brief point before that because uh, the, this, uh, and obviously this is democracy, he can say whatever and uh, it, it's fine. Uh, and, but I would like to say that even for the most cynical person, what, how, what would a major gain from hiding resources? What's the political gain? If you want to be a cynic and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this for political gain, in what do I gain? Election. What do I gain in, in political deal? What? No, no, Thank but, but I'm, I'm answering you. What would it gain? So it's easy to come and, and post a question and be controversial about it, but when you go to the bottom of it, to the logic of it, it's, it's, it's not logical. Uh, any politician, no politician would do that to gain favor of their people. You know, uh, you could say there have been errors in the process, and that's true, that always happens. She started by saying that we are human and they are, are human. But to say that they are hiding uh, resources, uh, for what reason, you know, for what reason? And, 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 and that's the basis of it. And the other thing I would like to say is that, you know, elections are in six months. In six, eight months, uh, the people of Ponce will vote, and I, I think you're from Ponce, right? You vote in Ponce? No. Uh, well, well, well they get a chance to vote, and hopefully they'll vote for whoever they want, and that's part of the right. But uh, to come and and on, and ask uh, for for her uh, to ignore the democratic will of the people of Ponce is wrong. Also, you know, there have been, there was an election, and it was not 50, 60, or 70 people that voted. She has the votes of thousands of people, and her term. If the people wants it, want it to end in December, it will end in December. If not, the people will speak and we'll see. And that's a right, the same right as you have. I'm not mad and I'm not attacking you. You have the right to, to, to make uh, all the statements you want. That's democracy and we need that for, to have that discussion. But at the same time, we hear a lot of things all the time. Uh, they may seem logical, but when you go to the bottom of them, they, they are just, uh, you know, nobody in their, in their right mind w would do that because there's no gain in doing what you are uh, accusing her of. Thank you very much for the clarifications. Again, this is what democracy is all about. We appreciate your question. Thank you so much for coming. So we have another question over there. Yes. yes. How do you choose where to go? You know, I mean, there's the, the whole world has crisis. There was an article in the Washington Post just recently in the island of Lesbos in Greece where, you know, you have refugees that are getting less than the two meals per day, less than the calorie count. Et so how do you choose, right? I mean, how do you choose? And then how do you, you know, there's some countries, unfortunately, like Puerto Rico, like the Caribbean, that are just going to, you know, it's recurring tragedies. I mean, it, 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 it's every so many years it's going to happen. So do you kind of to pick up on the mayor's comments earlier about, you know, planning. Do you do you plan ahead? Do you look for local partners? I mean, obviously, Puerto Rico you haven't because you've worked there, but in countries where you maybe you haven't worked. Yeah. So thank uh, you. Absolutely. Um, so first question, it's, it's tricky because we are always, every situation is different, and so we're always evaluating. I think the key thing for us is where where are there gaps or where is there a situation where our expertise or experience could be a benefit to support the local communities or to um, maybe expand upon what's already been done? 
Uh, we've tried to put parameters around it and said, well, we're going to just stay in the Caribbean. And then a couple of years ago, uh, we found ourselves in Indonesia. Um, uh, more recently, uh, there was a, a big earthquake in Albania in December, and we found ourselves out in Albania supporting the local community, not with a huge team coming in. Um, so a lot of it is, is sort of making the decisions based on the circumstances of the particular situation. There are some situations that are much more obvious, a Category 5 hurricane coming, disrupting services, um, places that we have strong networks um, or that we know are going to be hit frequently, like the state of California, which is perpetually on fire now. Um, you know, those types of situations are, are a little bit more clear, and then we sort of have to look and, and analyze and see as, as things unfold. And I think we are, we're in an unprecedented time. Uh, I think we're seeing the direct impact of, of the changing climate. Um, whatever you believe is causing the changing climate, I at least think we've come to a general consensus as a, as a planet that the climate is changing. Uh, category five hurricanes used to be once a decade. Now they're multiple times a year sometimes. Um, You've got wildfires. Uh, we have a team down in Australia uh, that's been working down there and supporting down there. So uh, we're certainly seeing the, the need of uh, an organization like ours uh, more frequently. Um, but it is a lot about looking at that specific situation, looking at partners, looking at where we can be a benefit. Uh, the second piece is, yes, I think connected to uh, the the growing need uh, in in these places we're sort of now in a place where we can probably guess that that there will be a major hurricane to hit the Caribbean this year we don't know where it's going to hit uh, Dorian originally we actually went down to Puerto Rico uh, when Hurricane Dorian was coming originally it looked like it was going to Dominican Republic and then it was going to hit Puerto Rico and so we went down there to start mobilizing then it missed Puerto Rico and went north and then hung a left right into the Bahamas. Um, remember, it was going to hit Alabama for a little while. So, you know, we can sort of, you know, at least have a sense that, that we need to be ready. Um, and so we're, we're starting to do this. Uh, we're starting to look at where in the Caribbean we can uh, begin pre-positioning um, materials uh, to be able to respond. The Bahamas for us was a, was a major uh, effort where we had helicopters and planes, and we had never done this before, but we were we recognized that, that we needed to move quickly, um, and we were dealing with islands, and how do you get food onto an island? So all of this learning over the past couple of years, we're now starting to put together um, into uh, a bit more of a coordinated effort. Um, Jose Andres announced uh, last week that we're, we're work gonna work on with, with ourselves, with partners from the public sector, the private sector, and also with governments on uh, what, we, what he sort of, what we've tentatively called like a 21-day plan, where the first 21 days after a, a, a disaster, you need to move quickly. There's no, there's no delaying. You can't sit around in a convention center talking about what you're gonna do. You have to be able to move super fast and be able to cut through all of the nonsense. And one of the big challenges I think that, that we face as, as a nation, if we're looking at the United States, is FEMA does two things. It, it's sort of supposed to coordinate that initial response, and in some extreme cases will be directly hands-on in the initial response, but a lot of what FEMA does is the long-term recovery, right? It's the allocation of funding, it's giving people money for the, to rebuild their homes, it's, it's allocating, you know, billions and billions of dollars and tracking that, and it's, it's a lot of work. Um, and sometimes what happens is we sort of stumble over ourselves in those early days because we're, we're caught up in thinking about that longer term recovery when we just need to, for the first couple of weeks, we just need to get people, you know, stabilized. We need to get the situation stabilized. So um, I think that's gonna be a next really important um, piece of, of what we all need to do kind of collectively to come together and, and recognize that what are the things that we need to do in those early days? How do we get food, water, shelter, medicine to people immediately? How can the governments have the flexibility in those early days to allocate, spend money smartly, um, and obviously, you know, tracked, um, but to, to be able to do those things and not have to wait around for 20 approvals for something. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's that type of flexibility. When we were um, responding to the earthquake, uh, 
th there was a, a desire for us to come in and support uh, one of the schools that was being run by the Department of Education. And as as the mayor said, um, you know that's you're stuck there because it's run by the Department of Education. And so even though she wanted us to come in, she had to make phone calls, she had to call the governor, she had to get approvals just for us to come in and serve some meals. Um, and so if we can kind of recognize that those first few weeks are gonna be critical, we can start moving quicker, we can start identifying what are those resources we have to have in place and, and potentially even pre-positioning them. The one last thing I'll mention because I, I think it's very interesting as we look at, at the future is also, um, recognizing that if we have to bring everything in from the United States to the Caribbean, it's very difficult. Uh, Puerto Rico has uh, a naval base uh, on the island uh, called Roosevelt Roads. It's been sitting around for about 15 years. It was abandoned in about 2004, Not abandoned, it was left by, by the Navy. Um, it's a, it's, and it now looks a bit like Jurassic Park, kind of overgrown and kind of crazy, but the str it's, it's got a high school, it's got like uh, it's got buildings, it's got infrastructure, it's got a, it's got an airport, it's got a deep, deep, deep water seaport. Um, so we're now talking and working with the the, um, the government of Puerto Rico and some uh, some of the folks who are looking at developing some of it of setting up sort of a a, a, a sort of a relief uh, hub where it can serve to to respond not only in Puerto Rico but the U.S. Virgin Islands and other areas within the Caribbean. And so, but I think it sort of just underscores the fact that we have to recognize, we, we have to stop being surprised by these things happening, right? I mean, we keep telling ourselves after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans and we had the Superdome situation, after uh, you know Harvey hit, hit Houston, after Maria, every single time we sort of sit back and we go, wow, that was, wow, we weren't, you know, that was so intense, that was so crazy. And I think it's time we all come together and recognize that, you know what, it's, it's, time, to it's, it's time to assume and pretty much be, be ready for it to happen again and, and to know what, what everybody's gonna do. So it was a long answer, but um, very, very important question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting questions. Are there any other questions? So I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. Please, go ahead. We can be quick, we can be quick. You okay? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh. A little loud, sir. <laughs> um, so just to, uh, I'm talking with organizations like Teach for America and Leaders for Educational Equity about how we can support efforts in Puerto Rico. And so I wanted to talk, um, address my question to the mayor and say like, what are the immediate needs? Like, what do you like, what do you think is like, hey, come now or like support this organization right now in doing this and kind of like the long term. Like um, we know that with all the trauma lately, mental health um, is a big issue. We know that there aren't teachers, there's teacher shortages all over the US and in Puerto Rico. We know that kids can't get to school because the schools need reconstruction. We also know that kids can't get to school for other reasons like transportation because there were previously a lot of schools closed. Um, and so kind of just like your point, like what do you think we can do and how to, can we support? Well, one of the things I, I will tell you that in school about school, the decisions has to be made by the Department of Education from the central government. I exposed to them, uh, to the Secretary of Education, I have a, uh, a convention center uh, that is filled, uh, that is, can be filled by 3,000 people. You can use it with no charge, okay? That's one of the things. The other thing is that uh, there are buildings that are closed, the store has left, and, and I have told them, for example, uh, that they can use Home Depot, it's a big, big, big area, and they can uh, play schools over there, high school uh, for there, and at the same time, there are all the places they have. I have talked with the uh, president of the Federation of Teachers here in Puerto Rico, uh, in here in, 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 in Maryland, and she's a friend of mine, and I have been in Congress with her, and we have talked that uh, teachers need to work. For example, there is a group of two sisters that uh, have been for more than one month teaching in, tar in, 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 in tarps, in tarps in a park. They have more than 500 kids over there. They are from private school, from a private school. 
And I said, and I went to see the Secretary of Education, and I said to him, please, convalidate those times for, the, for those kids. Because the first week of school, we are supposed to, they are supposed to work with the emotional part of all the kids. And then after that, they will begin with all the classes. There are virtual classes at the same time, at, through the internet, through the internet. The ones that are going in high school, the ones that are going to high school, they will be in the universities or the college university branches over there, Caribbean University, uh, University of Puerto Rico, where I, where I study at the same time. And there are other places. Uh, this week is supposed to begin the high schools. And they, will give the, the, they are going to give them three credits for semester of, uh, of the first year of, uh, of college. The other thing is that I believe in God. I'm sorry, but I believe in God. I believe in, in, in another fullness. Pray, pray for the people to continue struggling, to continue fighting for, for the real needing of the people. I believe in, in, uh, in the volunteerism. I believe it. I believe it. And I believe in non-profit organization at the same time. Non-profit organization at the same time has helped the governments. And that's important for all of us. So it's important that, uh, that you as a student here uh, can talk to other ones and say, we can go maybe in a, uh, in a, in a semester, in, in weeks, uh, to do uh, some volunteerism uh, time. And you can visit 78 municipalities, as they say. Vieques need it, Culebra need it. Uh, and and we, have, uh, we have now, let me tell you this. Puerto Rico is divided in, in two places. The Federation of, of Mayors are the one who believe in statehood. And the Association of Mayors is the one who believe in the Commonwealth. Now we are creating seven of, of, of the 78 mayors, we are creating the League of, of Cities. The League of Cities work with the issue that we can, came, came to politics to help the people, to serve the people. There are per persons from the Commonwealth and there are persons from the New Progressive Party. And uh, uh, next, next Thursday, uh, in two days, they will, uh, 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 Oxen and Four Foundation are going uh, to collaborate with this League of City to help them. We can make others mayors to help their financial or their areas for getting better services for the people. As, as I said, I have been 34 years of, as, as a dentist. I have been 11 years as a mayor, and I'm still working for the people. I work for the people in the cold, for the people in the urban area, and for the people in the rural area at the same time. Well, you have to take care of them. Uh, we, we create efforts. Uh, uh, there, are, there are students who doesn't believe in sport. Okay, but they believe in arts. So we create some other areas that uh, they can be presented in the historical theater of Ponce uh, to uh, make plays over there. And we have participation of 11 schools from Ponce, private and public school. So give time and opportunity to people can express, to people can. Now we have a coalition of, uh, from the uh, uh, Commerce Association, uh, coalition from the merchandise area, from the academic area, and the political area of Ponce. And this coalition is going to reconstruct the island. We have already approved 19 big projects to be reconstructed, uh, about, uh, more than $150 million. And at the same time, 48 small projects of $133,000 that uh, we have gained in, in federal funds for reconstruction in every area of each community. So we continue still giving opportunity that the third sector can be work together because I am not the one who decides who's going to make the, the, the projects. It's the people of my city who are the ones who decide it. So that's important. If, if I may, uh, after, after uh, we, we can also give you, provide you with information of, of, 
of the education department of the municipality so you can talk to them and maybe coordinate something with them that, that in the areas where you can help, it will greatly benefit the people. We are, uh, two areas I, you ask, uh, the two areas you, you addressed, uh, mental health and, and, and education, so are there maybe the, along with uh, uh, you know, health and, edu and, and, and Social food. Social workers, are psychologists. Are very important at this time and yeah, very yeah. much help, uh, very, uh, a lot of help is needed. So we'll give you the contact so, so we can coordinate something in the future. Thank you very much for following up on that question. Thank you for the question. So we have time for just one last question. I think we are behind right now. So please, oh, let's be me. brief on this one. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say thanks to um, all the cooking nutrition. And I hope that you can do the port on Aguadilla and you have ability to like, I don't know, how can you work with the embargo um, laws that we have in Puerto Rico that are really difficult for us to get food there. My name is Mariana Soler and I'm from Barcelona, Puerto Rico. And my question is for you, Major. Um, first was, what are the efforts, if any, that the government is doing to give mental assistance, mental health to the people that have been affected? And the second one is, what are the efforts that the government is doing to provide affordable housing to all the victims of this? Uh, first of all, uh, in, in, the, in mental health, I would say we have uh, received many, 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 but many volunteerism from School of Medicine of Puerto Rico, the Ponce Health Science University, uh, uh, workers that have psychology center who has a psychology doctoral degree. At the same time, AMSCA, who is part of social uh, workers uh, that uh, treat people with drugs. They are also helping. There have been uh, many psychologists, psychiatrists going to different places at, at the satellite shelters and the, and the shelter that is uh, recognized by the central government. We have received many, many, many help from people who are well prepared in mental health and, and, and after they had give, give the treatment to all these people, they have in a, in a manner of a more conscious uh, way of treating people on having they and, they and they feel more secure. But it's continuously, the social worker continuously, the, the psychologist continuously, the school of medicines, volunteerism. For example, we have just right now uh, uh, an engineer, structural engineer from Louisiana and from New York, working at the same time with the Colegio de Ingenieros from Puerto Rico, uh, working in the different areas because we have to check more than 60,000 houses in the same place in Ponce. That was the first question. The second one was... Regarding housing, affordable yeah, housing. Regarding housing, uh, we have different programs. We have a housing department, municipal housing department. We receive a federal form from Section 8, and we have more than 100 vouchers, and we gave it to them, the vouchers, but they have to fill forms, federal forms that to require uh, that, that require center information from them. My people, uh, I have a person in charge of, of the management of all the citizens. She's an excellent uh, 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 social worker. And she has been taking many persons to the different agencies. And so I asked the governor uh, that she should uh, uh, have in every shelter representative from the uh, Department of Housing, the Department of Health, uh, Department of, of Fiscal Area, Department, every, every representative. So they have been helping all those people. That was Section 8, HOT. HOT at the same time uh, is helping, um, and the government of Puerto Rico took from the banks all the houses that were uh, repossessed. Uh, Repossessed. Repossess. Uh, uh, there are more than uh, 1,000 houses from all over the Puerto Rico. And they gave, it, gave us uh, the lease uh, to all the mayors uh, in the south uh, to take, talk to the people that doesn't have a house because not all, not, not all of them need a house. Some of them are afraid to live alone because they are, uh, they are oldest and they don't want to live alone. I met a, a lady who was 93 years old, and she said to me, I stay here during the nights because I am not living uh, behind a roof. 
So I said, uh, would you should go and, and go to your place? And no, no, I, 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 I accompany with people here. And we talk all the night. And, I did, and, and, and that's what she said. And, and I'm happy she said that. And because I'm talking with people, I don't live alone. I live alone in my house, alone, because my daughter lives in San Juan, and, and I live in the south. So I'm happy because I am with God. I am feel that they're working for the people, doing things for the people, for the people. So uh, I will say Section 8, hot at the same time, the lease that repossess the housing at the same time, public housing has been given them, public housing. Airbnb and the has a program also, Airbnb. AB, uh, uh, SB, uh, SBA Airbnb. also is helping, giving some of them that could have, uh, uh, could have loans at the same time and have the money to pay, repay at, at a low, low percentage. And at the same time, uh, FEMA has uh, paid them for 18 months to be in a hotel if they want to be in a hotel, 18 months. So after that, after those eight, 18 months, the house will be all replaced and all fixed at the same time. Thank you very much for your question, Maria Elena, and thank you for coming. So, <laughs> on behalf of NYU DC, Brotherman Center, I want to express my gratitude to everyone here in this auditorium, to everyone who made the time to come, and of course, to our wonderful panel today for taking your time to speak with us about these very important issues. So I think that we, you know, new technologies and measures of preparation, maybe we can hopefully reduce the vulnerability of Puerto Rico in the future. So I encourage everyone in this room to come visit the island soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>